Friends Podcast. Hi, I'm Diane Hunt. I am an impressionist realist painter connecting with nature through my brush. I work in oil paint and watercolor and I live in the countryside of Maryland's eastern shore, not far from the Chesapeake Bay. You can find me online at dianehuntstudio.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Diane Hunt Studio. Hi, I'm Constance Brosnan of Steve Brosnan's Jewelry Designs. I live in Oklahoma on a prairie, and I make uh, handmade jewelry in silver, copper, and brass. I'm an artist that paints. I paint pastels and in oil sometimes. Hello, this is Clyde J.K.L. I'm the host of this podcast, I am a emerging representational artist. I do historic rend- renderings, seascapes, landscapes, volcanicals, birds, and whatnot. The tight illustrative hand in watercolor, thin and ink, and acrylic paints. And I live in Oklahoma City. Well, here we are again. It is a Monday, and this is September the 14th, 2020. My name is Clyde J. Kale, and you are listening to the Artist Friends Podcast, episode 62, and I am here with my two best artist friends, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson. Hello, Diane. (laughs) Hi, Clyde. Hi, Constance. Hello, everyone. (laughs) Hello, Constance. Hello, Clyde. Hi, Diane. Hello, everybody. See, I did it right this week. I didn't, I didn't want to confuse you like I had the episode. <laughs> okay, folks. If you go to um, www.talkartpodcast.com, that's talkartpodcast.com, you'll see the links to the videos that we're going to be uh, talking about. We're going to be talking about the uh, Hudson Bay River School of Art. It actually wasn't a school of art, kind of like last episode, the uh, Ashcan, they called the Ashcan School of Art, which really wasn't a school, the Hudson, the Hudson Bay River School. I think they've got one now there, but uh, at the time in the uh, 19th century, uh, it, uh, it didn't exist. It was just a, a group of artists who painted in a particular style. Now that Diane, because she's really familiar with the Hudson's River School, <laughs> that's kind of like in her area of the country up there. And um, I'll let Diane tell us a little bit about what 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 was or what was the style and the uh, uh, main subject of the artists of the Hudson uh, Hudson River School art movement, I guess is more or less. Well, they they did. Um, I don't know if I'm an expert, but they they did. Um... Uh, landscapes and they started out in the Hudson River Valley area and they moved ended up moving into other parts of the country too but um, they all basically it started out around New York and in that area Um, I'm familiar with them because I grew up in New Jersey and I was I exposed to those paintings a lot a lot of them are in the museums and stuff around New York and Philadelphia and uh, DC so I've I've seen a lot of them in person, and um, they're they're pretty nice <laughs> to say the least, yeah, as far are. as landscape painting goes. But they um, some were more realistic than others. Um, and some were more um, romantic. They had that romanticism in in their paintings than others. But um, overall, they were landscape painters and. Um, yeah, so that's basically landscapes. how it started. Yeah, landscapes with some maybe some figures, you know, in, in, you know in, 
Yeah, but they mainly put the figures in to give it, to give the landscape, um, so you had something to go size it, so you knew how magnificent it was. <laughs> how yeah. grand, how, what the grandeur it was. Yeah. One and that's the, what the figures kind of did for them. But. One of the artists that came out of, out of that movement was uh, Albert Bierstart. And what I found interesting was almost all of the artists that moved, they were European artists. They were trained in Europe, but then they immigrated to the United States. And it was just, uh, you know, enthralled with the, the beautiful uh, countryside, and, you know, and, and the... Uh, yeah, well, they had moved from Europe where in the industrialization was, start, was going on, and there was a lot of pollution in the air, and they didn't really have the opportunity to get out of the cities much to to the countryside where it wasn't polluted. And um, when they moved to the United States, it seemed like it was this magical you know, place that um, they hadn't been able to see for a long time. So it was like spectacular to them seeing the scenery, which a lot of the places are spectacular anyway in any, yeah, even in this day and age. <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, but moving from that industrial um, society and then coming out to the, basically out to the country, it was it was quite a shock to their systems. I'm sure. Well, like I was saying, Alva Bierstadt, he, he you know he's German. He was trained in you know in a Dusseldorf uh, art school, and uh, Thomas Moran was a uh, who later he didn't necessarily come from the Hudson Bay uh, area, but he was an emergent artist later on. Uh, he was uh, he was from England, you know, born in England, and so. Uh, and several, several of the others. Uh, what was it? Thomas Cole. You know, he was. I think he came from England. You know, and I, I just found that to be, uh, you know, fascinating. You know, and uh, they mentioned uh, Albert Bierstadt. Of course, he Bierstadt. Of course, he he sticks out uh, the most because he actually he went out west and went out and is very famous for you know the uh, California and the the Yukon Valley and the uh, Nevada and the Nevada Saharas and the uh, uh, and he also painted you know Yellowstone Park and uh, these grandioso uh, magnificent uh, Teton Mountain scenery and and just yeah n not only that he did he paint them but he painted them huge like <laughs> you know scale wise they were eight, what was the one was eighteen foot long I think I know I've uh, seen. Just it's amazing. like amazingly huge. <laughs> I, you know, that's a lot. That's a big painting, and uh, that's that. That part of it's remarkable to me. Just in the amount of paint that would take, and how you know the amount of time and effort that would take to paint something that huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Great. And I've seen some of those in person, so they're they're magnificently big paintings. Yeah, I've seen a few. Too. They're really gorgeous paintings. But the yeah. secret, the secret. So I mean. People they see how big, and they say, "Well, God, how do you how do you haul that canvas around?" No, he actually made oil painting sketches on site, and then he took them back to the studio and composed mm -hmm. and painted those huge paintings. They were all done in his studio, you know, which is which is remarkable in itself, you know. And and yeah, when the, when he started to gain some fame, you know, it actually created a uh, a. a massive migration west because people wanted to go see those those and those areas i remember um um stephen bauman you know is heavily influenced by albert Bierstadt and mentions him several times and uh he uh you know he states that uh when people would get to the actual sites they were somewhat disappointed because they weren't as, <laughs> as magnificent as they saw in the Bierstadt painting you know <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and he even he did take, you know, have artists who take artistic license to move things around. Even though he would put several things in one painting that you couldn't see from that particular spot that he was painting from, but they said that he did it in order to get the landmarks in, so people would become accustomed to seeing those landmarks and then go look for them. Absolutely, and you know, so so. Uh... His, I mean, his paintings, and then of course a lot of his paintings they were made into postcards and, uh, you know, advertising brochures, and it created a, a, a rush for uh, you know people to uh, to go out west to 
to travel out west and to you know see these spots, these magnificent uh, areas. And Ber- and Berstadt uh, in the 19th century, early 19th century, or well, mid 19th century, actually what 1860s, 1863, 64. Uh, he was, uh, yeah, he became famous. And one of the the uh, in the uh, the lecture that was uh, given about Berstadt, where uh, at that time it was very common for to have single painting art shows and Bierstadt would have one of his giant magnificent paintings and would give an arch set up a show just that one painting they would have like velvet curtains and and lights and everything they would charge people like a quarter you know to come in and sometimes they'd have prints available and at least postcards Mm -hmm. And it would unveil with grandiose, with music in the background. And that was like. It was a show. It was a big show. It was a show. Yeah. Now you talk, and he was an entrepreneur. And so he's like an early artist. Let me get in tongue tied. Entrepreneur. Because he painted those paintings with the intentional purpose of marketing them out, you know, to sell. Absolutely. Right. You know. And he would actually earn money for the painting before the actual painting was sold. And then, of course, in this this um, in this lecture, you know, that one that she described, uh, he sold it for like twenty five thousand dollars to a a big uh, I think it was a railroad. Mag- I'd like to see you pick up one of those now for twenty five thousand. <laughs> twenty five thousand back then, which is I wouldn't even buy the frame now, probably. Yeah. millions of dollars in art in modern day uh-uh. you know millions of dollars now i'm sure but uh he was uh you know so he made money from the prints and the postcards and the shows the guy was a true yeah he was a marketer he was he, exactly like you said uh constantly he was an well author. he he knew it was popular for, you know for people that what they wanted to see so he he kind of painted to what the you know what they were expecting they they wanted to see the yeah you know, stuff from out west and that was like a lot of the people were in the cities and stuff on the east coast so um, you know what the stuff that was going on out west they heard about things and you know people would come back and tell them about like the um, stuff in Yellowstone the um, old faithful and the lava you know bubbling up in the ground and all that stuff but the people didn't believe it and then mm-hmm. they just started going out there and getting the paintings and the photography along with it. It that, kind of proved that the stuff was real, that it wasn't just uh, stories. That, that's a good segue right into about Thomas Moran and the Yellowstone Park. Uh, there is an excellent documentary about the, uh, called, titled uh, Drawn to, Ye- to the Yellowstone, which is included in the links. I recommend all of our listeners to watch <coughs> a very enjoyable uh, documentary. And, for example, I learned quite a bit. I did not know that Yellowstone Park was the world's first national park when Congress designated it as, as a park. And this is where I immediately thought of Diane, with your phrase, connecting your brush with nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, are, <laughs> you are definitely influenced by these artists, definitely, because we have Yellowstone Park, folks, thanks, and thanks to artists. The story goes that Thomas Moran, they were uh, setting up uh, a mountain man. Jim Bridget was the first one who came back telling stories about the geyser and the bubbling sulfur pits. And people did not believe him. They, they thought it was tall tales, just a tall tale to West. And for years and years, people back East did not believe that these things existed. They, they were just fairy tales, you know, fantasies. Guys were saying that in bars to get drinks, you know, so, <laughs> so it was, uh, and, uh, so there were several exposition, ex, uh, exhibitions or ex, can't say the word expeditions. There we go. <laughs> Spit it out, uh, <laughs> arranged to go and investigate because Yellowstone was pretty much still unexplored. Yeah. That area. And, uh, on one of these, uh, drunts, uh, the uh, they the gentleman brought along an artist. He wanted to bring along an artist and a photographer. The artist that he because he he knew the artist uh, Thomas Moran, who was an an unknown emerging artist. Also, Albert Bierstadt was recommended. 
they contacted Albert Bernstein, and he said, no, not this time. I'm going to go to California because I guess there was some big oil magnet in California, and he was going to you know, earn some money in California. He turned it down. Thomas Moran went with, uh, the story goes, with the uh, photographer, and it was a collaborative uh, work because some historians believe that they brought l along an artist in case the photography didn't work. At least the artist could make sketches and watercolors. And they investigated all these mysterious areas and were amazed. And it was a great collaboration because Thomas Moran was able to help the photographer in his composition. And well, same part of it, too, was that there, back then there was only black and white photography. So mm -hmm. they heard about all these, you know, people heard about all these crazy colors of things out in, in, the, in the park and you know, nobody believed it because it doesn't sound like it could be real. Mm -hmm. But then the painter could show all the color that was there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so they they went and, and uh, you know when they came back from the uh, journey, then it was decided we've got to convince Congress to preserve this park. Now these are artists that are doing this, folks. Okay. They so with a combination of. Thomas Moran's uh, paintings, and then the photography, they actually convinced Congress to designate uh, the Yellowstone Park as a, the world's first national park. And it, if they didn't have that, they wouldn't have had, you know, they was, oh, it's just fantasy. You know, you're just, you know, you guys are drunk, you know, whatever. <laughs> but they actually got, you know, and they got it designated as a, uh, as a national park. Okay, Thomas, Thomas Moran. Then, and I love this story. Okay, first of all, I was beer start heard about this and was already kind of ticked off, kind of jealous. <laughs> you know, upstart, you know, whatever. Then Thomas Moran did this massive what seven seven foot by twelve foot painting of the. Uh, it was big too. Stone I don't I don't remember the measurements, but it was big. Mm -hmm. He did this magnificent. You know, all-encompassing painting, and of course, his style was it was different from Beer Star, but it was still very much a uh, romanticized. You know, and he he put things in a view that weren't necessarily there in real life, but it was an outstanding composition. He ended up selling that painting to Congress, which sent <laughs> Beer Star over the hill. He was absolutely. <laughs> I love that story. He was absolutely, it's this young upstart. And what he, because Beerstart wanted to sell his, had been trying, that hadn't been that successful at that point in his career to sell his paintings to Congress to get him in this, in the state capitol, you know, in the, in the Washington, D.C., and to get him in the White House and you know, whatnot. <laughs> and here this young upstart does it. So basically, Ye the Yellowstone adventure uh, launched Thomas Moran's career. And of course, at the same time, like one historian stated in the video, um, you can learn about marketing from uh, Church and Moran and Beerstock because they, he, uh, Thomas Moran got involved with making prints and just postcards. And then, but what enthralled me was um, it was artists who got yellow, preserved Yellowstone. It was, and to this day, uh, artists are still drawn to it. In fact, afterwards, uh, after the park, then the railroads uh, commissioned artists to do brochures to attract people, you know, to, to, cause they built railroad lines close because before, I mean, you had to take a train to, what was it, like uh, Idaho or someplace, and then you had to take a uh, horse and buggy <laughs> it took you forever to get in. Yeah, that had to be some serious roughing it when they went camping back in those days. Yeah. I mean, you think about how yeah, good we have it now. <laughs> Even camping, how good we have it now. <laughs> and think about how, how bad that was, how rough that was back in those days to go on an expedition like that and live outside day after day, day in and day out. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't do it. Absolutely. Yeah, they did say how long it took. I don't remember. Was it eight days? Eight days. And once they got off the train, it was another eight days to get to Yellowstone. And then they had to hike into Yellowstone. It was another few. I don't remember how long. Yeah. It was a long time. But they were carrying all their equipment. Mm -hmm. uh, that that, that had been crazy. I mean, <laughs> they were talking about all the equipment for the photographer because yeah. all those 
and everything. He had to go with him, and the glass plates and all that. And the camera back then wasn't a little tiny thing on your telephone yeah, either. It was a yeah. humongous box you had to set up and get everything just lined up in order to take a photograph. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That was an overhauling <laughs> amount of stuff. Yeah, I mean, we – we uh we stand we stand on the shoulders of those guys in in our mm-hmm. art and everything, and I really like the uh, uh, the comment that one historian or made that to this day you can see cars uh, headed headed into Yellowstone Park with easels strapped on their tops. You know, artists are mm-hmm. still coming to Yellowstone. You know, and it's uh, it's such a you know an, an attraction. And well, there's a certain day of the year that the water isn't the the waterfalls at El Capitan where they the sun hits it just a certain way on sunrise and everybody is there every year to take that one photograph where the sun lights up the waterfalls and it only happens like one day out of the year and then it has to be a clear day also because if it's cloudy then it never lights up the falls but so uh it uh, yes, it's really really a chore. I think that brings us up to uh, a break. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about artist mentors, a Raffi rant. Okay, so you've been listening to the Artist Friends podcast, episode sixty-two, and I'm here with Diane Hunt and Constance Brosson, and let's take a brief break, and we'll be right back. Remember classic old-time radio? Old-time radio still lives at pulpradioart.com with Quiet Please, the thing on the Forble board. Quiet Please, the thing on the Forble board is a pulp radio art graphic novel inspired and based on the 1948 horror radio play. Utilizing an edited abridged version of the original script with Clyde's hand and digital illustrations, these scary, exciting stories will spark your imagination. Quiet Please. The Thing on the Forble Board is a true keepsake for the old-time radio fan. Available in printed copy or ebook at pulpradioart.com. That's pulpradioart.com. Welcome back to the Artist Friends Podcast for Monday, September the 14th, 2020. My name is Clyde J. Kale, and I am here with Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson, and this is the episode 62 and we have been talking about the wonderful landscape painters of the uh, Hudson Valley uh, River School of Art the, basically the art movement now we're going to go on to something else that is uh, really critical there's a video on there from Raffi our favorite Raffi artist who uh, rants he gives some pretty good advice but uh, what prompted him to uh, create that video rant was one of his uh, followers sent him an email talking about a uh, artist mentor who was really pushing this artist into a niche area that she did not, or he didn't say she or he did not feel comfortable with. And then because they didn't want to comply, the mentor said, well, you know, you're never going to succeed. You're, uh, you're, you're just not going to uh, be successful at all in your art career. And so she left left the program he she or he left the program and wrote to Raffi about that it said that uh, this was you know how can you tell that you know to an artist and Raffi had brought him up to uh, he didn't mention the mentor but there are several out there you see them on you know on across YouTube and and across the internet advertising some are good some are maybe not so good but the idea of niche marketing seems to be this main theme that they seem to push. And uh, Diane, what the, what, you want to add some comments on that? Well, um, that sort of goes back to the gallery idea where the gallerists kind of, they wanted their artists to um, be known for painting a certain thing because it was hard, it was easier for them to sell the paintings then than it is if the artist is doing all kinds of stuff and they can't really focus, you know, it seems like they can't focus and they're all over the place and they don't know how to describe them basically. So they, the the galleries like the artists that stay in their lane, so to speak, and they can kind of, um, you know, makes it easier for them to sell the work. So I think that's kind of where that comes from, I guess, to some extent. But um, as far as, 
mentors telling you <laughs> that if you don't follow what they say, you're not going to make it. That's kind of that's that's really bad. I'm <laughs> I don't kind of I arrogant. cannot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, a lot of the mentors that are out there are not even artists. They are you know they haven't been in the market themselves trying to sell their own work, so they don't. They're looking at it from a different um, point of view than most artists are. So I think it's very difficult for them to be able to say that. Like, but um, not, well, like, I mean, anytime you take a course from anybody that is mentoring you or telling you, you know, what you should or shouldn't do, you have to take everything what they say with a grain of salt. You can't. Mm -hmm. I mean, what works for one person might not work for another person at all. So you can't. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. You just you just kind of have to go you know weed through it all and and pull out what you can use, so that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> you want to you want to add your comments on this? Yeah, I'm pretty much with Diane. I mean, you ha if you do something like that and you get into an area where you're kind of being pushed to be in a niche and you don't want to be in that niche, you just kind of have to do your own thing because in the end, you're the one who has to make the art and if you're not happy making it then it's going to show in your work you know yeah if will. you get niche niched into something you don't like doing it's it's going to affect the quality of your work eventually you know when you want to bust out and do something else you just need to bust out and do what you want and that you know? i like the advice that the uh, rapper gives and stuff, you know? If you want to go down a particular niche or get into a particular gallery, then follow that recommendation. But if you are really feeling uncomfortable and you just don't feel like it's you, this art is personal. It's your baby. It's what you create. And you have to feel comfortable and you have to appreciate uh, that. And uh, just as an artist, just, you know, do what you want. Don't try to fulfill a, a certain niche. And uh, if, uh, you know, these, uh, a lot of these mentors, you know, there's some good mentors. They offer some good advice, but especially the ones that aren't artists themselves, they are the ones you sh probably, probably should avoid, actually. Uh, and uh, you, uh, you know, you're paying hundreds of dollars, sometimes thousands of dollars for, and for these people. And, uh, the advice are given may not apply to you. It may apply, you know, apply to other people. And uh, so, uh, do uh, do diligent. Be very uh, uh, critical of uh, who you pay money to, to or who you accept as a mentor and as a coach. And uh, be your own. well, it's really it's when you're looking at people and you want to get a mentor. It's really hard looking at them and trying to figure out who the best one will be. And because, you know, you talk to other artists and this other artists tell you, oh, this person's fantastic or, you know, and maybe it was, maybe that person was for them, but not, it might not necessarily be for you. So, I mean, you, it's really hard to tell a lot of times when you're looking at it from the outside. And some of the, uh, some, there are some mentors that never, that aren't artists, but they have gallery experience or they, you know, been on the other side of the table like so they they can guide you in different ways than another another artist That's would, but participated in that i, I yeah. yeah i mean it, there's so negative i don't want to say his name now but uh he uh he, he did more than just meant uh mentor he he coached he inspired he uh he motivated and uh, you know and, but he came from several years of experience so uh uh it, that's a different ball game you know but then there's some of these so i've seen this i think i know the mentor the rapper was talking about he didn't say his name obviously but uh i've seen this guy uh uh advertise on youtube quite a bit you know and he says has this ever happened to you and we'll leave it at that yeah you know? <laughs> but he's not even an artist he's more focused on on internet marketing you know and everything and it just well that's how they sell what they sell is by marketing and that works for them you know you just have to figure out if you do take from somebody the thing to do is just go ahead and get what you can get out of their course that you can use for yourself and then move on you know absolutely 
because and, somebody's and, always got some information that you're going to find that's helpful. And there are may not be all of it, but there's probably going to be some things in there that you can find useful. So just, a lot of really good mentors and coaches that offer a tremendous amount of free advice. So, mm-hmm. when you, you know, if you sign up for the course, you get the more personal, but the free advice is a wealth of information. You know, we've, we've featured in here, uh, uh, Sergio Gomez, you know, it's outstanding some advice. Stefan Bauman, you know, they're all, you know, they're mentors and they're coaches. You know, they have mentor and coaching programs. But they, the advice that they put out is just a wealth of, you know, information. I've been very satisfied with their information. And uh, well, I think what makes them more valuable as far as the information that they're giving out is they are both artists and entrepreneurs of their work, and that's helpful because it's somebody who has, you know, your path might be a little different from theirs, but at least you can, you can get some information from them about how they went about getting there, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It goes back to what Rafi, you know, his advice is that they're actually working artists, you know? So, so uh, like Diane says, take it with a uh, grain of salt, as they say, and, and, uh, flip off and uh, grab the information that is useful to you. Cause you have in the end, you have to create your own artistic journey, your own career. You have to manage your own career. You have, have to uh, look yourself in the mirror and decide truly what you want to do with your art and how far you know, you, you want to advance. And that's all that matters in the end. And no one can give you specific advice except yourself, right? <laughs> yeah, you have to listen to yourself in, in the end. Like, you know, you can only take so much from other people, and then you have to put stuff into action and, and get your button, button gear and do stuff. Otherwise, nothing happens. You, know, you can get all the information you want in the world, but if you don't do anything with it, it's not going to get you anywhere. Yeah, that's true. That yeah, there's no magic bullets. <laughs> <laughs> pay somebody ten thousand dollars hey make me famous no it don't work that way no <laughs> hey, make people want to buy my paintings no it don't work that way <laughs> you got to put in the hard you know and uh, the hard work and there is some luck involved you know thomas moran is a perfect example back in you know he was he was at in the perfect spots and it's you know yellowstone launched his career and yeah you know, there's well he knew yeah a lot of it was networking he knew somebody that knew somebody that <laughs> <laughs> that said his name, so he got in the door. So there's great, you know, a great deal. In the end, though, it's it's do. It's like Stephen Bauman always says: do good work, do great work, paint great paintings, and you know, and drawings and illustrations. In the end, that that's what went wins. And like we've said many times before, available to us now, we can access millions and millions of of viewers through social media and everything. And the artists in the 19th century didn't have that available to them, you know? So we, we are standing on their shoulders. And uh, uh, so uh, I think that's, I'll, I'll end with that. You two got any final comments or? No, but I've already said my piece. <laughs> yeah, I have to. Okay, let's, let's wrap this episode up. This, you've been listening to the Artist Friends podcast episode 62 and I, my name is Clyde J.K. and I'm here with uh, Diane Hunt Constance Bronson and I'm going to say bye-bye to Diane and Constance and I'll let Diane say goodbye to everybody. Good night everyone. Good night Clyde. Good night by Constance. <laughs> it's your turn. Good night Clyde. <laughs> Good night Diane. Good night y'all. Good night, folks. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us some love. Give us a positive rating. Give us a thumbs up. Give us some five stars. However you hear these podcasts, we really appreciate it. Good night, folks, and thank you so much for listening. The Artist Friends Podcast is produced and edited by Clyde J. Kale. Participating artists, Diane Hunt and Constance Bronson and Clyde J. Kemp. You can find more information about Diane Hunt at www.dianehuntstudio.com. Constance Bronson at www.
Etsy.com forward slash shop forward slash C B R O S N A N S. Clyde J. Kill at www.cjkaleartworks.com. If you would like to participate or appear as a guest on the Artist Friends podcast, please email cjkale at signedmystery-otr.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a thumbs up or star rating. And most of all, send us your comments. This podcast is issued under the Creative Commons license.